Hi, this is Brian Strauser, Principal and CEO at BrightPath. And in this webinar, we're going to be talking about insider threats, the threat that is lurking inside of your organization. Just briefly about BrightPath, we are a consulting firm based in Shoreview, Minnesota in the United States. And we work with the world's leading brands, public sector agencies, and nonprofit organizations to help them strategically navigate uncertainty and disruption. We focus in a number of areas, including crisis management, physical and global security, intelligence, crisis communications, and business continuity. By way of background for myself, I spent 21 years at Target Corporation entirely within the global or corporate security organization. Uh, the last six years I was there, I was the head of crisis management, business continuity, and intelligence globally for Target. Uh, in 2014, I founded Bright Path, where I'm currently principal and CEO of a growing consulting firm. In today's webinar, we'll be talking about three specific topics around insider threat. First, how insiders steal your intellectual property. Second, some basic mitigation actions that can address insider threats. And then lastly, the importance of strong law enforcement partnerships, particularly with federal agencies. Let's start by talking about some examples of uh, the inside threat, of insider threat in an organization. So if you look at the individuals that have committed these acts in the past, um, there are some key profiles that stand out. And I want to illustrate some characteristics of those individuals along with some examples of where this has happened before. Um, so there's four kind of key profiles of a threat inside your organization. The first is somebody who just wishes to do harm. They're disgruntled, they have an ax to grind uh, against the organization or their supervisor or some other member of their management chain, and they just, they just want to cause harm. They just want to see the world burn. Um, the second profile is someone who wishes to take your intellectual property or other data and then use it for their own business or take it to a competitor. So they're being, in a lot of cases, they're being compensated uh, for bringing this intellectual property to another organization. The third is someone who has very deliberately placed themselves in a position in the organization in order to obtain access to intellectual property or other data. And this includes one of the bigger threats because of the level of sophistication that they often bring to these cases, and that is a person uh, who is representing a nation state or they're an organizational actor or agent. Uh, and we're going to give some examples of what that looks like. And then lastly, it's an individual who wishes to be a whistleblower, and their objective is to expose as what they expose what they perceive to be the organization's wrongdoing, even though that wrongdoing may not really be wrongdoing in the eyes of the public. It is to them, and that's their motivating factor in being a whistleblower and exposing, you know, what it is that they believe you're doing. Let's look at a couple case examples. The first is Michael Mitchell uh, from 2010. He was a, an employee at DuPont Chemical. And Mr. Mitchell became disgruntled over time and was eventually terminated for poor work performance. DuPont did everything right, some of the things that we're going to talk about later in this webinar. But they reminded at his, him at his termination of the non-disclosure agreement that was in his employment contract. And they made a demand that all information be returned. However, Mr. Mitchell had been keeping electronic and paper files from DuPont for over a year, and, and relatively soon after being terminated, he entered into a consulting agreement with a competitor of DuPont in Korea. He was caught not because um, something stood out necessarily during his time at DuPont, but because he began approaching current and former DuPont employees to participate in his intellectual property scheme. Uh, he was sentenced uh, to 18 months in prison. That's a reduced sentence. He was a cooperating witness in a number of cases and thus received leniency from the U.S. attorney in this particular case. One of the greatest insider threat uh, cases of all time, Edward Snowden, who um, downloaded uh, a significant amount of information uh, within the United States intelligence community and then made that information public. Uh, via Wikilinks and some journalists uh, and continues to cause harm to the United States with his disclosure of information over time. How did he do this? Well, he, 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 was a, he saw himself as a whistleblower. His motivation was, I'm going to expose this wrongdoing that's going on 
uh, within the intelligence community uh, and elsewhere uh, in the United States government. So he wanted to be the whistleblower. He wanted to be the person that exposed this information. And he, as a contractor, he had uh, fairly broad access to information that allowed him to make all of these downloads um, across the U.S. intel community, particularly the NSA, and then share that information to journalists and to Wikilinks. The next example is from 2007, and this is Chi Mok. Uh, Chi Mok was an individual who was deliberately sent by Chinese intelligence to pursue a position within the United States defense industrial base with the goal of obtaining information. And he worked in the U.S. defense industrial base for 20 years, entirely within the U.S. private sector. And he communicated information back to China uh, related to the Aegis missile defense destroyers and cruisers. Uh, the United States Navy's concepts for stealth ships and the electric propulsion systems used in the next generation of U.S. submarines. He revealed a significant amount of information to China, and he was even using his family members to bring encrypted information uh, on small electronic devices over to China from the United States. He was arrested and sentenced to 24 years in federal prison uh, for his disclosure of this information. So there's a few case examples. Let's talk about how to find and mitigate that inside threat inside of your organization. So with an insider's threat, there's a number of personal risk factors that um, can be observed. And, and usually here we're not looking for just one of these um, because a lot of folks may uh, exhibit one of these characteristics, one of these risk factors. But what we're looking for is perhaps a combination of these risk factors to drive up that insider threat risk level. The first is greed or a financial need. They have a specific debt that they want to uh, pay off or they just have a desire for more money in general. They may be exhibiting anger or desire revenge for some perceived slight in the workplace. They may be exhibiting performance and other problems at work, uh, difficulty in getting along with others. They may have an ideological motive. They may identify with a particular cause or a desire to help the underdog. They may have divided loyalties between perhaps your organization and their home country uh, or some other organization that they have loyalty to. They might just be doing it for the thrill, for the adventure of doing so. They may have a vulnerability to blackmail that's being exploited uh, that may be driving some of this behavior. Or it could be an ego thing. They have a, a self-image uh, challenge in that they think they're above the rules and they don't believe that these rules apply to them. They may be someone with an ingratiating personality or might be exhibiting compulsive behavior, or they may just be having relationship issues within their family, uh, their marriage, or some other romantic relationship that is driving, increasing the risk for them as an insider threat. There's also organizational factors that make it easier in some cases, in some organizations to commit these kind of, of actions. The first is availability and ease of acquiring proprietary classified or protected materials, uh, just a lack of, of good access control policies. Think about things like a clean desk policy that's not followed where highly confidential information is left out uh, in common areas or in unsecured private offices. That's what this is getting at. It's easy to get the information, therefore I feel like it's available to me. Poor labeling of information, so you know internal policies on marking uh, documents and other information. The ease of exiting your facility with boxes or IT equipment or internal information. If you're if you don't have a, a strong security team and they're not questioning, you know individuals leaving with boxes or computers or you know bags full of information of documents, then you don't really have uh, good control of what's going on there. The fourth is just undefined policies, such as working from home with sensitive information where well, I can get away, I can do this because there's really no rules around doing this. Um, perception of just lack security in general. Uh, time pressure where I'm, I'm working under the clock, therefore I'm just, I don't have time to secure this stuff and your rules are just making it difficult for me to work. Or just lack of training. You may have the programs in place, but the programs are not well the team is not well trained to follow the programs. Um, there's not good awareness of what the programs are. There's also behavioral indicators, things that we see someone do 
that increases that risk that should indicate to us that there's something odd going on here. The, the first is just seeking access or taking information without a specific need or specific authorization. So this gets back to the need to know rule that should be in place. Like what's the, what's the minimum amount of folks that need to be able to see this document? And if somebody else wants access to it, but they don't really intersect with the, the content that's in the document, why do they need access to it? So someone who's constantly seeking that access. Uh, individuals who inappropriately seek information not related to their work duties. Um, somebody who has an interest in matters beyond the scope of their duties. And this is an interesting one because people who are, let's call them high potential or kind of fast movers in an organization, they're interested in things beyond the scope of their duties. I was in, in my positions when I worked inside of an organization. I wanted to learn these other things. But when combined with other risk factors, that might be viewed differently. Um, the fourth is individuals who remotely access systems or networks during odd times or like constantly during vacation or, or days off where the system access is just strange. Someone who unnecessarily copies material, particularly proprietary information. You know, why are they duplicating the highly confidential document? It's strange. Uh, someone who works odd hours without authorization. So like if they're in the building at three o'clock in the morning, why? Individuals with unreported or unexplained foreign friendships and travel. This, this starts to apply more when we start talking about um, intellectual property that might be dual use or might be, uh, you know, have a military purpose um, or something along those lines. Or you're dealing with classified information. Um, if they have unreported or unexplained foreign relationships with travel, that's odd. That's a, that's a big risk factor. Sudden unexplained affluence. They suddenly show up with an $80,000 car. Uh, last week they were driving a Toyota Corolla. Maybe they were saving, uh, but why the sudden affluence? Affluence, and then lastly, suspicious personal contacts. Just the company that they keep uh, seems strange or out of place, uh, given their work duties and other responsibilities. So there's a number of mitigation approaches that organizations should have in place to make this more difficult and to mitigate this behavior. The first is to have a way to report suspicious behavior. Uh, so you can have an integrity hotline uh, or a confidential reporting hotline, whatever you want to call it. I would reinforce that regularly with communication, with clear communication about how to report suspicious and threatening activity. Make sure you have a process on how those reports are handled once they're reported. They probably, you can use an outside service for this, but there might be some initial triage. And then it goes to a responsible party who has some investigative independence and in how that's followed up on. The third is to make sure you have good policies and procedures in place to reduce the risk of an inside threat that could impact your organization. We're going to talk about this in a moment. You should have a crisis management process for when the threat becomes a reality and the incident has occurred. And lastly, you should communicate regularly through a communication and awareness program to keep this issue in the front minds of your employees. And then lastly, before you hire someone, you need to make sure you have appropriate screening process to select new employees. And this is really critical. This is your chance to make sure that you're getting the right people in the door. So you want to make sure that you're scrutinizing their prior employment record uh, where that's appropriate. And again, you need to make sure you're working with HR and your employee relations council for this because there's lots of laws around the screening process, hiring process. But scrutinize their prior employment record. You're looking for uh, you know, changing jobs frequently is a one that's you know, difficult to judge. Uh, were they switching jobs because there was a better opportunity at the other location? Were they switching jobs because they had performance or policy problems, policy violations at the previous job? Uh, or they, or are just generationally they're in the generation, the millennials, who change jobs more frequently. And there's nothing. There's no malice in that. They just continue to seek new opportunity, more interesting opportunities. And then make sure that you're using appropriate legal uh, appro and compliant background checks. Um, again, there's a lot of laws around this, so make sure you're following what the laws and regulations call for. We talked a little bit about policies and procedures. I want to go into this in a little more detail. Um, but there's two categories of policies and procedures that we think are important. The first revolves around the security of your information. You should address in your policy and procedures the classification of information 
and every document that is created should have an information classification on it. One one way to do it uh, that works well, but this isn't this may not be nuanced enough for some organizations. But public meaning that it can be shared externally, internal only meaning that only employees of your organization can see and view this document, and then proprietary secure handling required. And then define what that means, but that's more of a need to know. And here is who that information is allowed to be viewed by and what secure handling means. You're probably talking about uh, some type of storage in a, in a safe uh, or in a locked file cabinet, uh, not left on a desk, uh, has some kind of cover sheet so that the contents are not immediately viewable. It really depends on how you decide to set this up. But you want some type of classification of information so that it's clear to your employees what the document, what's the content of the document, and how do I need to handle and secure the document. The next category is of policies is within information security is just physical and logical controls for information. You probably want some variation of a clean desk policy. Things to be things need to be put away. Uh, you may need to supply or require like what information needs to go into a safe or into electronic encrypted storage. Uh, how do you handle external drives and how is access management to information handled both physically where we're talking about locked file cabinets and offices and safes and that kind of thing and electronically uh, who has access to certain information. And then uh, number three in, in information security is just to make sure you have the appropriate non-disclosure agreements and invention agreements in place to protect your information. Uh, so work with your general counsel's office on that. And then lastly, how do you report information security violations and how is the management of that incident set up to make sure that it's handled properly and that there's good follow-up? Then from a physical security perspective, you should have appropriate policies for access control and management. Uh, I would include in that, uh, you know, searching certain items that are being brought out of the uh, organization, like computers, like you know, taking out a, if you're willing to have a file cabinet on a dolly, this is probably an issue. But those are things that we want to make sure are addressed in policy and procedure. And then as, as exceptions occur, then work the exceptions to those policies. The next thing is to make sure that you have good monitoring processes in place uh, within your organization. You know, three of these are electronic in nature. It's, you need routine monitoring of your network for suspicious activity. Um, so we're talking about live on the wire monitoring that's looking for strange activity that shouldn't be there. The second is filtering of emails for outbound communication. I'm looking for attachments. I'm looking for uh, the text of secure handling required. I'm looking for um, PHI and PCI based information. I'm looking for credit card numbers. I'm looking here to find out if somebody's exfiltrating information by sending it to their home email. Third is using applications for uh, to monitor or block external drives, so thumb drives or even a big hard drive that someone's plugging in. Um, I want to monitor that, and in some cases, I want to I want to keep that item from working if this individual doesn't have the privilege level to be able to do that. And then, from a physical security perspective, there's a lot here to look at in terms of how security officers patrol your uh, headquarters locations, or your sites, and your campuses. Um, how, uh, what we're asking them to look for, inspect, search, and et cetera. There's a lot that can be done here in terms of security presence. Uh, that's probably way far beyond the, the content or purpose of this webinar. But there's a lot that you can have the security officers do to make sure that they're assisting in this area. When employees leave, um, I think there's three important things that need to happen. The first is that there's an exit interview process. And part of that exit interview process, uh, they, I'm sorry, the exit interview really needs to be conducted if they have access to information that you do not want disclosed to the public. Because the surveys show that if that it's important to remind them of their non-disclosure agreement obligations and then remind them they need to return any proprietary information immediately or with whatever time frame your agreement, uh, your employee agreement or your NDAs uh, have set in place. This reminder of their obligations has been shown to drive behavior in a very positive way to make sure they don't disclose information to competitors or the public. 
Lastly, I want to just talk briefly about working with law enforcement. And, and I like to use this image. I don't think you're going to see this in an intellectual property case. Um, but you've got kind of the sheriff's SWAT guys here responding to an incident. And I, I'm always, I always like to use that image because when it comes to relationships with law enforcement uh, or other first responders, when you need a friend, it's too late to make one. And this is a motto on the, one of the challenge coins from the United States Northern Command in Colorado Springs. The point here is that when the bad thing happens, that's a really bad time to be meeting some folks from your local FBI office or your local law enforcement agency for the first time. I would build these relationships now uh, so that you can help each other along the way and the relationship is in place when something, when your critical moment hits. In a, in a case like this, an insider threat case, bring in law enforcement early if that is at all possible. Um, would highly recommend you start with the local FBI office. Just call the local division uh, that services your area and start that conversation there. Um, every FBI office in the United States has a counterintelligence group. Um, there's trained agents who specialize in counterintel and they can provide assistance throughout the investigation. They can even provide assistance really early on in an investigation. And in a lot of cases, they've got access to a number of um, training and awareness materials and even seminars uh, that they can come in and teach in your organization or mat have material that you could incorporate into your training and awareness programs that may help you um, from a prevention and mitigation standpoint long before uh, something happens. And again, that has a lot to do with building that relationship up front. So that's the end of our webinar on the threat lurking inside of your organization. If there's anything that we can do to assist you with your global security or intelligence program or any of our other areas of expertise, don't hesitate to contact us. You can reach me at brian.strauser at brightpath.com or via phone at 612-235-6435. And be sure to check out our website for our free training courses, insights via our blog, white papers, and other writings, and our other webinars at brightpath.com. Thanks for listening.